I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Many people would say questions about India's status as a liberal democracy have become irrefutable. But now, with Arvind Kejriwal's arrest and financial action taken against the Congress party, has a new and bigger and perhaps more worrying issue arisen? Does India still qualify as an electoral democracy? That's the key issue I should explore today with the Saul Goldman, Professor of International Studies and Social Sciences at America's Brown University, Ashutosh Vashne. Professor Vashne joins us live from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Vashne, let's start with the question, is India still a liberal democracy? Before we address the second issue, does it continue as an electoral democracy? In an article that you wrote for yesterday's Indian Express on Thursday the 28th, you said, and I'm quoting, India's liberal features have declined to such an extent that it's no longer a liberal democracy. Can you start by identifying the areas where there's been a precipitous collapse? So, um, liberal democracy is defined as electoral democracy plus some other features, which are persistent, which cover not only elections, but also um, how the government conducts itself, how the governments conduct themselves, and how um, the polity conducts itself. So those features are uh, typically four in all conceptions of liberal democracy freedom of expression, freedom of association, which is essentially about uh, freedom to form non-governmental organizations, and sometimes the definition includes the press, um, freedom of religious practice, and the fourth thing is protection of minority rights. Uh, almost all uh, definitions of a liberal democracy would include at least these four features, if not more. And on all of these, all of all the four features, um, India's records over the last decade has been um, not as as resplendent, as sharp, as good um, as it was um, historically. Um, and therefore, um, most democracy rating agencies and most democracy theorists, both democracy theorists in my profession, political science, and democracy rating agencies all over the world have been um, downgrading India's liberal democracy because freedom of expression uh, of writers, of artists, of, um, of various organizations that are uh, uh, regime opposing, regime supporting organizations and intellectuals are free to speak, but others have felt a great deal of pressure not to speak freely. That is very clear. Uh, freedom of press has been curtailed, and regime supporting civil society organizations, for example, the RSS, have been free to free to operate, but a number of civil society organizations have lost their licenses to operate. 
uh, research organizations have been have been under grave threat and uh, minority rights um, have been endangered that is the reason why liberal democracy uh, when it when you examine india as a liberal democracy most rating agencies and most democracy theorists do not uh, view india as one as you say all four key features of a liberal democracy have diminished declined and become narrower in the last 10 years does this mean that this has happened mainly during the 10 years mr modi has been prime minister um that's a fair statement to make yes and therefore does the responsibility and the blame lie with him the responsibility uh, it's not that state governments in india non bjp state governments have practiced uh, a liberal democracy um um to a great extent there have been uh, freedom of expression has always had a, a a troubled career in indian politics and both uh, non bjp governments and bjp governments um uh can be blamed but uh the amount of power that delhi has that the central government has puts the matter uh, or presents the matter very differently when you think about uh, how the bjp government has dealt with these freedoms are you saying the majority share of the blame lies with mr modi one will have to say that yes Let's now come professor Vashne to the question does india continue as an electoral democracy in your article for the express referring to robert dal you say electoral democracy has two dimensions participation and contestation would you accept to begin with that with a turnout of 65% at the last two national elections and an even higher turnout in some states during state elections india remains a credible participatory democracy in terms That's of participation correct. you say we remain participatory and credible yes on that dimension in the indian democracy even under mr modi cannot be faulted the the the, the electoral participation has been very high uh, uh, in fact higher since 2014 than before and in some states like bengal and some northeastern states it's been it's touched 75 to 80% not just 65 66% so on um, electoral participation which is one uh, constituent dimension of of uh, the the concept of electoral democracy uh, seminally uh, proposed by developed by robert dal uh, the late robert dal perhaps the greatest democracy, democracy theorist after the second world war um yes Uh, india even under mr modi satisfies the participatory criterion well and here would you say the credit goes to the enthusiasm the dedication the commitment of the indian people the voters uh, that is correct um the voters have participated more and more and more in elections um so there is no doubt that uh, um the participatory enthusiasm of indian masses indian voters uh, is to be celebrated the problem as you point out in your indian express article lies on the contestation front you write and i'm quoting you imprisoning opposition leaders and freezing the bank accounts of the biggest opposition party are tactics aimed at crippling the major opposition forces as a result contestation of the rulers and the central principle of electoral democracy can become critically less fair and less free do you believe that is the actual outcome in india has it begun to happen yes so um this claim could not have been made um for two, the 2014 national election or 2019 national election um even if some people argued that uh, as for example um we dem institute of sweden perhaps now the most widely read um institution on its for its annual democracy reports worldwide um um i did not agree with their claim that uh, elect, that the contestation is no longer free in india 
they made that claim right after 2019. Um, and my argument was that uh, if half of the states, at this point, it's 16 BJP, at this point, uh, as, as of this moment, 16 states are with BJP and 12 with non-BJP parties. Uh, out of India's 28 states, and uh, roughly half of states uh, since 2014 have been with non-BJP parties, have been run by the non-BJP parties. So that itself shows that there was enough contestation available, and uh, political parties were free to challenge the incumbents, um, the rulers in Delhi, or for that matter, in at the state level. Uh, but now. Um, the selective use of law to uh, and the uh, to to um, jail opposition leaders and the selective use of law to um, cripple the financial capacity of opposition forces um, is leading to a situation where electoral contestation uh, can be expected to be seriously um declining uh and is declining i think um and therefore uh, the other critical dimension of an electoral democracy namely free contestation of the rulers or free contestation of the incumbents is now in serious crisis and declining so here, if I understand your answer correctly, you're saying the arrest of Arvind Kejriwal, a sitting chief minister, after the declaration of the model code of conduct, as well as the income tax action being taken on finances of the Congress party, both of them are crippling contestation. Both of them are reducing that second critical dimension of an electoral democracy that Robert yeah. Dahl wrote about. It's impairing it very badly. Yes. So... Um... Uh, adversarial freedom um, is an extremely, it's a critical part, it's a constituent part, it's a defining feature. If participation is one, adversarial freedom uh, or freedom given to opposition parties to contest uh, the ruler is, um, is a constituent defining element of, of electoral democracy. And uh, um, had these things been done earlier, uh, you could have said that uh, you could have perhaps given the benefit of the doubt to the ruling regime. But uh, after the declaration of the model code of conduct and so close to the elections, um, the use of law in this manner um, is uh, amounts to constriction of electoral freedom, constriction of electoral space. Um, and therefore, on the contestation dimension, India's score is, is declining and will soon be presented as such by the rating agencies. Now, you make one further point in that Indian Express article. You say, because no one can predict who will be targeted next for imprisonment, India threatens to become a democracy by fear. The spread of fear surely will further triple contestation, won't it, and make the situation which is already bad worse. That is correct. The, uh, the fear dimension of electoral contestation or political contestation is, should now be recognized as very serious and, as you rightly put it, as very seriously impairing uh, freedom to contest the, the rulers. No doubt about that. As you said, it won't be long before the agencies that evaluate India's democracy, be it the Economist Intelligence Unit, be it VDEM or whoever, will begin to pick this up. How much damage do you think this is likely to make to India's rating, or is that almost impossible to tell? So uh, all the agencies, whether they can't, Economist calls India flawed democracy. I think that was the term it used. Um, Freedom House calls it, a, I think, semi-democracy or half-democracy already. Um, I think semi-democracy is the term they use. It's roughly the same idea. And VDEM has been the harshest. VDEM, uh, the third agency, it's now the most widely read at this point. Um, and for them, India became an electoral autocracy, not uh, as early as 2020. 
and that's where India is headed now. That's what the rating agencies will say. That it's it's it won't be the old style Saudi Arabia style um, autocracy. No, no one would make that claim. Where elections either don't take place, or elections are absolutely meaningless. Even even in 2014, uh, 2024 elections and the state elections, some states will be won by opposition parties. There there is there is no doubt about that. Uh, there are three more elections coming up later this year. There are some elections coming up um, next year and the year after. Um, so uh, at the state level, uh, I think it's uh, clear that uh, the BJP will not be able to dominate the electoral space or hegemonize the electoral space, especially in the South. Um, and it may not be able, able to capture Bengal. We don't know. Uh, however, um, the it's it's not it's not it should not be viewed as a binary zero or one it is it should be used it should be viewed on a scale zero to one scale a sliding scale and it's on that sliding scale that uh, india's uh, uh, india is declining on the contestation dimension and will be remarked upon very soon let's at this point professor vashney try and form a big, broad picture of where this leaves Indian democracy as a whole. If India has ceased to be a meaningful liberal democracy, and now in terms of contestation, it's ceasing to be a meaningful electoral democracy, then what is the overall picture emerging of Indian democracy? And before you answer that, let me add two other questions. How bad, badly impaired is Indian democracy, or is the word impaired a euphemism? Um, I think impaired is the right word. Significantly impaired, you might want to say. Um, um, the What exactly for the, the uh, institutions of oversight, constitutionally given institutions of oversight, uh, for example, the judiciary, for example, the election commission will do, remains to be seen. And uh, um, there are people are not very confident observers as well as uh, opposition politicians in india and, and independent observers like outside or inside independent observers like me who have no party affiliation um uh, we are not very confident about what the election commission would do will do to make sure that the contestation is absolutely free and unrestricted and, and the electoral space is not constricted. Um, but um, but uh, I don't think we can give up the, the observers of Indian democracy or the supporters of Indian democracy. We can give up on the judiciary. Uh, it's not clear what the judiciary would do, how it will handle the remaining cases, or, or whether it will be able to uh, uh, make sure that the electoral freedom is restored. I think we are not sure about that yet. But uh, surely, so long as the judiciary is available as a relatively independent institution if, uh, of oversight, or not an entirely, if not entirely independent, relatively independent institution of oversight, you cannot, uh, will not be able to call India an autocracy. Um, can, I, can I interrupt and, at that point? Yeah. The judiciary yeah. does theoretically remain available as an independent institution of oversight, but it has not. And I make this point deliberately, it has not so far responded in any way to Congress's petitions, either at the high court level, and there's one now coming up at the Supreme Court next week, to help Congress in its present plight. So let's leave the judiciary aside. We don't fully know how it will respond, but there are certainly concerns that Congress is expressing that they've been let down both at the tribunal level and the high court level by the judiciary. But what about the election commission? How much of the responsibility for India's impairment, serious impairment to use your phrase, as a contestational electoral democracy lies at the doorstep of the Election Commission? A very great deal. Um, election Commission is not an arm of the executive. Constitutionally, it is an independent supervisory body its main job is to conduct elections in a free and fair manner. And 
And after the model code of conduct, conduct has been announced, it has to especially watch out for um, restrictions on electoral freedom, on the, on the freedom of political parties to contest the, the rulers. Uh, election commission, that's why I said the election commission, um, um, whether it's doing its job, now there are extremely serious doubts about it, extremely serious. We still have to see what it will do, um, but um, uh, the way it has conducted itself do not inspire optimism. On judiciary, I might say one thing. Um, the, the, the stand it took on electoral bonds uh, would suggest that some independence still remains, despite all the doubts. And uh, it's possible that uh, it can still um, uh, support the democratic process um, much more vigorously. Uh, though that is an open question. On the, on, on the election commission's conduct, uh, I don't think very high, high marks can be given. So in your eyes, the election commission, just when we need it to be upright and courageous, has actually let down Indian democracy. That's correct. It's a very fair assessment. Now, in your Express article, you also ask the question, why is the Modi government doing this? The hypothesis you present is that it's one way of helping the BJP win 370 seats in the forthcoming election, which is the target the party has publicly set itself. Can you explain this point further? Yes. So um, two-thirds of um, 543 seats would be about 364, I think. That's what I calculated. That can be easily done, 363, 364. Um, and two-thirds of parliament uh, voting for you, for, for laws, uh, can... Uh, allow the BJP government, uh, next government, if it's a BJP government, to pass constitutional amendments. Um, simple, there are some laws which can be passed with simple majority, with 273, 274 votes, but some laws which are constitutional laws will require what is called a special majority, a super majority, and according to India's constitution, a constitutional amendment uh, requires uh, two thirds of support in parliament. And if it's a matter that concerns states as well, then half of states. Half of states are likely to be with the BJP. That's not, uh, that's a fair prediction. Half of state governments. So that will be satisfied quite easily. Uh, acquiring a two thirds of seats in parliament is the challenge uh, for uh, constitutional amendments. And if the BJP wants India to become a Hindu nationalist polity, which it is not under the constitution. It's not, it's certainly not a Hindu nationalist politics, politics de jure still. Uh, some may say that's a de facto one, but uh, legally it isn't. For it to become a legally Hindu nationalist polity, constitutional amendments will be required. And the principle of religious equality or religious neutrality will have to be dropped. That can be that can be done only with two-thirds support in parliament. And therefore, I, uh, my argument is that the BJP is not taking any chances with the uh, uncertainties of the election process, which is also a fundamental, a vital, necessary, defining feature of electoral democracy, election uncertainty. Trying to, trying to uh, control elections this way, trying to, to reduce election uncertainty to, to a minimum is, is a way to, to constrict electoral space, a term I have used, a term I'm using for democratic theory, or, or to make electoral contestation less vigorous than it can be. That's and the idea. intention that lies behind the deliberate impairment, serious impairment to use your word, of contestational democracy, and as well as the serious impairment of liberal democracy, the intention that lies behind both is a desire to change the constitution and give yourself the power in terms of MPs to do so. That is what you believe is the intention behind it. 
that's the that's the best hypothesis that a political scientist like me or political observer like me can present that's the best now my last question professor varshan could mm. india have continued as a meaningful electoral democracy once its liberal dimension had virtually ceased to exist or was it inevitable that electoral democracy would in due course be throttled once liberal democracy had been successfully extinguished was one inevitable after the other had happened <clears throat> theoretically a distinction can be made between a liberal democracy and electoral democracy the liberal democracy as a concept is much more comprehensive covers not only what happens during elections but also what happens between elections um and as i said those four features are common to all conceptions of liberal democracy some some conceptions uh, are more comprehensive than that but at least those four features appear everywhere uh so um so um at least since 1945 uh, it's been claimed after the experiences uh, especially in europe and also in america north america uh, between the two wars um if not earlier uh, at least since 1945 it's been claimed that if you throttle liberal democracy then very soon you'll start uh, uh, impairing significantly impairing electoral democracy also but theoretically distinction can be made practically what happens is that the more you attack liberal democracy the more um there will be a tendency towards restricting the full flow of electoral democracy as well um but the distinction conceptual distinction remains practically uh, whether the distinction holds is uh, for uh, scholars and observers to check with evidence and the evidence in india now is heading in the direction of uh, Uh, sign uh, a significant impairment of electoral democracy as well that was not true in 2019 and certainly not true in 2014 but it is now increasingly looking as if it's true in 2024 it is increasingly uh, looking like uh, the most probable outcome one last question if i may professor varshna are there any unforeseen surprise developments that could save the situation for india and if there are how likely are they to happen uh the biggest uh, role uh, that any institution in the politics can play is that of the supreme court and india's judiciary um it is um and in 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 theory and constitutionally speaking uh, in, uh, also according to india's constitution the uh, ultimate arbiter the ultimate referee um and if it plays that role uh, successfully um uh, for example if it um uh restores um the freedom of political parties to campaign um and whatever laws have to be used against them uh, maybe not during the campaign not during um um the electioneering um there would be some laws which will have to be maintained but the idea that you're crippling political parties uh to campaign and to contest the the incumbent the government that is um uh against uh, democratic principles uh against uh, any notion that uh, my entire profession has about a democracy means but uh so so much depends on what the judiciary does um Absolutely. theoretically and at, at, theoretically also what the election commission does but most people would not um uh, be very hopeful about what the election commission would do whether it would deliver on its constitutional obligations but we cannot lose hope uh, when it comes to the judiciary the judiciary still has the power to intervene and make the process uh, the electoral process much cleaner and much uh, much more much fairer and doesn't that mean professor varshne that as far as the situation facing the country at the moment today is concerned 
A lot depends upon how the judiciary, and I suppose at the end of the day, we mean the Supreme Court in particular, responds to Congress petitions regarding the income tax action being taken against them. There is absolutely no doubt the, that in conditions like this, the Supreme Court will be the ultimate arbiter, the ultimate guardian of Indian democracy. If the Supreme Court does not play the role of uh, a guardian of democracy, regardless of, uh, regardless of um, legal guardian of democracy, regardless of the, the, the political, what political parties do, then Indian democracy would be in, in greater trouble in greater, greater trouble. Professor Vashnoy, thank you very much for making time for me. And in particular, thank you very much for waking up at the early hour of virtually six o'clock to do this interview. I'm deeply grateful. Take care. Was, stay safe. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Karan. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.